Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate y'all all being here. This has been a real good year for me as a result of the device, and so this is a pretty much a, a no-brainer for me to come and share the experiences that I've had with this. Uh, I think I've had several things during the course of my career that really made a big difference to me. Uh, the femoral nail was big when I first saw the first femoral nail and the impact it made from treating patients in spica casts and traction, which was a part of my residency. And so we started nailing femur. That was pretty dramatic. Probably that was the thing that led me into trauma. And then the, the cannulated screw made a big difference in my life just because it was I didn't have to use six, five screws anymore. And then in 2006, when the screws got long and went up to 180, that really opened up a whole whole other realm. And I've used the Zeme image since the early 90s when I worked in Seattle. Uh, since for the days we were trying to figure out what's a good inlet, what's a good outlet, and I think we've come a long way. And I'm just going to go through some case examples of what we learned over the last year and show you some videos and things like that. This device is the Zeme uh, Rotating Anode Flat Detector, the RFD3D, and it's a little bit unique. It's a routine C arm. And it's this device you see here. It's just a normal C arm. But it goes through about a 165 degree arc, and then it's got a little bit of extra movement to it that gives it 180 degrees of rotation. And um, I think you'll see some of the images that come off of it are pretty impressive. So I've worked with it since uh, August of last year, and I can tell you that this has made me a lot better surgeon, uh, very candidly. Um, it's really helped me understand what I'm doing, and it's made me, I think, a much better teacher as well. Maybe some of our residents and fellows would say that it's made me a little uh, not as good, but I, I think it's made me a better teacher because I have so many more visuals now that I can use and I can really correlate real time what's going on. And I'll just go through some of the things that it's helped me with over the past 14 months. And so this is a 67 year old man who was in a car wreck. He, he ran into an 18 wheeler going about 70 miles an hour. And you can see he's got a fracture dislocation. You can see it's labeled post reduction because our resident who was very good in the emergency room was able to feel that he could reduce this hip but then as soon as he let go, he could feel that it, it wasn't staying reduced. This guy had a reducible but not a maintainable reduction of his left acetabulum. And you can see you can see easily the red arrow marks his transverse limb, and the yellow arrow marks where his dome, what's left of his dome is, and then the blue marks where his posterior wall is displaced. And if you get a 3D CT scan, you can see the comminution of the posterior wall, the involvement of the wall, and you can see the, the posterior column component of the transverse. And then on the CT scan, this is his injury CT scan again. You can see the transverse by the red, the yellow marks the impact dome, and the blue, the upper, the upper wall. And you can see the impaction, the impaction of the articular block into the posterior column, cancellous bone. And this is just the machine spinning. And this is a tech around, we're on 3.30 in the afternoon, four, maybe 4 o'clock. My morning time tech is still there. And he likes to start with the machine this way. And you can see how it moves over and then it goes to this extra little movement to give it the 180, gets it extra 15 degrees. And then it'll go around and he's already done the AP check to make sure he's centered over the left acetabulum. And then he'll stop it here as it goes to the lateral just to make sure that the table height is right. And then once we make sure the table height is right, then he'll finish with his collision check. That's just a, the way it's collecting uh, information to make sure it's not colliding with the patient or the table and then it goes to the same spin, and I'll show you what it looks like in the operating room once it's sterile in a minute. And so what I can get from that now is I can get these images, and this is uh, in the operating room, and this is just off my phone. The image that you get on the screen is better. And so now I can get this coronal reduced acetabulum, and I can see the, the impaction segments, and I can see the transverse limb, and I can see the posterior wall components, and I can see it on coronal, or I can see it on axial. And this is just me spinning it, you know, holding my phone and spin, you know, uh, scanning through the images. So basically, it gives you an intraoperative, uh, real-time um, axial, sagittal, and coronal imaging, and uh, just with that scene movement. And I can put these up in the operating room, and I can save these if I'd like to. These are just the now reduced hip, and so I've got uh, a better idea of what the patient's current situation is rather than what it was when he was imaged in the radiology department with the dislocation. This is a patient from about two months ago, and he's just got a nice clean fracture, and that's why I chose him to show you. He's just got a nice, uh, you know, clumpy uh, components to his fracture. This is his pre-op CT scan, and this is his CT 3D surface rendered, and you can see this is his intraoperative image. And so this is just him in the operating room, supine on the bed, 
before we start to make sure that nothing's changed. <coughs> you can ghost them in if you'd like to to sort of help that. And then the way we used it for this guy is we went ahead and did the reduction and did the fixation. And you can see he's still got a little crack. And if the little cracks like that bother you, you can check to see if your reduction is good. And so we did a spin on him once we did it just to see what the reduction was like. And so even though I don't like little seams, I'm not sure if I take this all apart that I can make this a whole lot better. So I'm, I'm pretty good with this reduction. So it's, it's good for assessing your reduction as well as your screw safety. And, I just thought this was pretty interesting as well. That's the intraoperative image on your left. That's just the screening AP at the end of the operation. And then the thing that you see with the staples, that's the post-op film. You know, that's the digital radiology. And I, I think the intraoperative AP is better than the post-operative one. You, you can argue and say, well, you got drains in the way and stuff like that. But I, I didn't process these with Photoshop. I mean, these aren't uh, like fabricated. Anyway, just the imaging is, to answer your question, I think the imaging is quite good. And then you can see the con what I got in the operating room, the intraop seam, axial cut of the dome, and then the post-op seam to scan just to see the, the quality of the, or the comparison of the two images. This is a 65-year-old guy, and you can see the asterisk is on the posterior wall dome component. And so this is, again, him supplying in the operating room before we start, and then we put his columns back together. And then when we roll him up in the operator oblique, you can see his wall is still displaced. So some of you may say, well, I just leave it alone. It's not a big deal. Or I clamp it percutaneously and put some screws in. Or I would do an, another approach. Or you, you did the wrong approach to begin with. I, I don't really want to argue all that. I'll just tell you how it really helped me on this paper. You probably know what's coming. So I clamped this posterior wall uh, just around the corner. I just put a clamp around and crushed it. And then I put screws into the wall like I've done for a long time where I thought the wall fragment would be based on a pretty good pre-op plan. And, you know, I, I, don't, I can't give you much better 3D imaging than that. That gives me a really good idea of where I need to hit this wall in order to put screws in it to hold it and to keep the reduction that I have. And you know it's coming and this is what it looked like before. And then here I am during, this is my first spin and I've missed the wall fragment with my screws. And so I put screws in, but I didn't hit the wall. I, I didn't try to do this, <laughs> just missed it. And uh, so I can take those screws out and replamp. I can replamp the wall, take the screws out, aim them better, and then spin them again and see that I can hit it. So that, um, yeah, when this, when these operations were going on, I wasn't planning on giving, I wasn't invited to give this talk. And so like, this is just like, oh, that's, that's a good one. So uh, I think this is a good example of how the technology helped this patient a lot have screws where they needed to be instead of screws where I thought they were. And if you don't get post-op CT scans, you probably don't know where your screws really are. This was a pretty interesting patient that I was on a Sunday. This is a guy who works for the University of Houston. They're having a really good football year, so he's a pretty happy guy. Worked for the University of Houston for a long time. <coughs> He's a young guy, maybe 42, and he's got bilateral hip fracture dislocations. His left side's a real peripheral posterior wall, maybe you can see the fracture fragment, and then his right side's a femoral head fracture that's uh, fairly low. You can see the orientation of the femoral head fracture. And so he had a closed reduction on the left that was very successful, and the closed reduction on the right was not successful. This is about his third attempt, and it's, they just the resident that was doing it just said, I, I can't get it to go back in. So he had a presumed irreducible, he had appropriate sedation a whole bit. So we sort of prioritized him to the operating room to do a fairly urgent ORIF. He was fairly ill and had an angiogram on the way. And then we put him to sleep on the operating table, and when he was asleep on the operating table, his legs looked pretty good. In fact, his legs didn't look like they had any asymmetry at all. When I rolled his hip a little bit, it felt good. Somewhere along the way, he had had spontaneous reduction of his right hip. So this was his left side, his peripheral posterior wall, so we can spin this. I can do an exam of this and I can realize this is a very stable hip, the wall's not too displaced, I don't need to operate on this. Now I go to the right side because I think I'm going to have to do an open reduction of this hip because it's stuck and all of a sudden it's not. So I can just proceed and go ahead and operate on this guy or I can spin him and when I spin him I can see what his femoral head looks like. I can see the little bit of debris in the back of the joint. I can see there's no debris in the dome, there's no debris in the fossa. I can examine his hip through a full passive range of motion, he's got a very stable hip. I look at the scrub nurse and say, I'm very sorry you've opened all this stuff. I've made a huge mistake and we all can go home now. Sorry. And so we wasted some money opening gear, but we didn't do a surgery that the guy didn't need. He spent six weeks in the chair and uh, he's celebrating with his favorite football team these days. So I think it has impact on sometimes changing 
your operative plan. I'm not sure I would have done that if I wouldn't have been able to assess that reduction. Maybe I would have sent him back and then come back another day, but this keeps me from having to do that. This is another patient that had a car wreck and he's uh, 42 and has an intraperitoneal bladder disruption. They think he has a bowel injury and so I coordinated with uh, Dr. Cotton on a Saturday morning. Um, Dr. Aker called me and asked me if I wanted to come work and he was doing about 50 things and so I said yep and so I uh, worked in with Dr. Cotton and you can see they ran the bowel and fixed the bowel and fixed the bladder and then they got through and left and then they left me alone with this and so then I can fix his pubis through their low laparotomy wound where they were fixing his bladder and then you can see the SI joint looks pretty good on this view looks pretty inviting on this view and so we just use a screw reduction technique for this guy he's a little bit sick for going uh, at it and then we can supplement it and in the operating room I can see if I got a good reduction if my screws are good or not I'm all done with this guy so I lost my Saturday morning but I don't really care because I'm gonna get my Monday afternoon so however you want to look at it I just know that I have a nice reduction and I have a good screw fixation and I'm, I'm all done with him this is a much sicker guy. Uh, you can see he's got a long line in his right groin, and we were trying to help him by stabilizing his ring. And if you look at that transiliac transacral screw, you you guys with the ladies with a good keen eye, you can see it, it, it's a little bit ascending. You can see it's ascending. And the S2 wire looks pretty good, but on the inlet view, you can see the S2 wire looks maybe like it's a little bit too posterior. So we went ahead and spun him while we had the wire in this position because it doesn't look good. And of course, his wire is almost in his canal, if not in his canal. This is his second sacral segment wire. That's this wire that's right there. Looks pretty good on that view. Looks a little posterior on that view. For sure it is. So I can go ahead and just, and then I can look up and you can see my screw that was ascending. It's out the other ilium. And I've done about, I don't know, 8,000 ileocycle screws. I don't know how many I've done, but um, I was never able to tell if I had screws extruded like this, except on a post-op CT scan, which a lot of people don't even get. For me, this is a really good thing, and I think it would be for all clinicians to know. So we can just adjust the, the screw, put it in, we can change that screw by using the bent guide technique, and then now we've got safe implants. I think this is a good, good thing as well. And I just want to finish with this lady I did yesterday morning, because uh, she's a really good example, and I, just, I always hate to say, well, I just did this operation yesterday, let me show you about it, but look at her greater notch. If you look at her greater notch, she was crushed by a horse in my hometown about 60 miles from Houston. And um, she lives real near where I grew up. And um, she's a very, very active equestrian. And um, you can see she's got a complete symphysis disruption. And she's got a very comminuted iliac fracture that goes from iliac crest to greater static notch. And her notch looks like it's quite disturbed. And you can see that she had an iliac artery injury and a superior gluteal artery injury. So they stented her iliac and they embolized the superior gluteal. And you can see the proximity of the coil to that fragment, the greater notch fragment. The greater notch fragment is turned 90 degrees and 90 degrees. Anyway, this is the combination of her ilium, and so we did not want to get it. I really didn't want to get into this uh, potential uh, bleeding zone. I think it's great when the angiographers control the artery. I just remember from anatomy there's a vein there as well, and uh, I just, uh, I've had experiences where I pull away a hematoma early on, and the reason there's a big ass hematoma there is because there's a hole in the vein, and that this is a deep zone to get a to, for me at this point to stay away from. This is her CT, and that's the proximity of that blade on the luteal, at least the artery. This is the embolic coil. So we just fixed her symphysis uh, from the front, and then we uh, used screws to just span this area of the ilium in the back, and I can use the spin. If, if, you, if you've ever had experience with these screws, and you get post-op CT scans, you can realize that sometimes where you thought they were is not where they really are and so this allows me to check in the operating to, to make sure that the screws are where I want them to be and they're not in the sacrum or sticking out the back of the ilium and that we're all done with her. For 14 months this has had a pretty dramatic impact on the quality of the care that I delivered. It's certainly made me I think a better surgeon, a better teacher. I can make real-time diagnosis, I can adjust my plans whether it's to keep operating or not operate. Uh, it gives me real-time information. I think uh, the quality of the images is quite good, and I think uh, just, uh, it also has driven me to be a much better uh, reducer because I'm going to get revealed uh, straight away. Uh, and then I think the implant safety, that's why I showed you that posterior wall one. So I, I think it's uh, time, time well spent, and you say, well, what's 10 minutes worth in the operating room? I don't know. You can ask your OR what, but I mean, just sometimes watch how long it takes an anesthesiologist to put your patient to sleep while they're in the operating room, and that's 10 minutes too. So 
Um, I just think it gives me a lot of information. And so this keeps me out of doing surgeries that I didn't need to do, like for the guy with the femoral head. This keeps me doing surgeries that need to be done rather than just cramming in some screws and then getting going, oh my God, it's not even close on the moment you convert it to open. I mean, I've just tried to show you some examples of, I think, some very cost-saving moves that happened. Maybe we didn't amplify that when we were talking about it, but when I didn't operate on that guy, we saved some money. Uh, when I did the right operation and I adjusted things, I didn't have to have this talk with this patient about missing the screws. I, he doesn't even know that there were some screws here and now there's some screws there 10 minutes later.